troubled soul, why so weighed down? You were not made to bear this heavy load. Cast all your burdens upon the Lord. Jesus cares, He cares for you. Jesus cares. Why so upset when trials come? Are you so easily forget to cast your burdens upon the Lord? Jesus cares, He cares for.
Hello everyone, a warm welcome to our Bandside worship. Today, as we begin to lean into our journey through Lent this year, trying to discern the spiritual attitude and orientation and activity that will assist us in facing into the headwinds of these testing coronavirus times, including how we might honestly confront the multiple challenges we are already starting to encounter societally and globally. From the depth of his theological reflection, Paul says, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices through your witness and your service. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and your thinking. By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you should. As the body of Christ, we have different gifts to share and to use according to the grace given us. Love sincerely, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord at all times. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people in need. Practice hospitality. Live in harmony. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people who are looked down on. Do not be conceited. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And now, calling ourselves deeper into worship on our journey through Lent, we say, where Christ walks, we will follow. Where Christ stumbles, we will stop. Where Christ cries out, we will listen. Where Christ suffers, we will hurt. Where Christ dies, we will bow our heads in sorrow and our hearts will break. When Christ rises again in glory, we will share his endless joy and his mission to bring justice to the ends of the earth. There is no other way. He is the only way. His is the only way. Let us pray. Loving Lord, on the hard journey of Lent, Open our hearts that we may feel the breath and effect of your spirit. Unclench our hands that we might reach out to one another in the family of humanity, in openness and in generosity. Free our lips that we might speak for those whose voices and views are not heard. Unblock our ears to hear the cries of the brokenhearted, downtrodden and oppressed, and open our eyes to see Christ in friend and stranger, so that in sharing our love and pain, our poverty and prosperity, we might move forward on our journey towards that peace and justice which come from you, and so be bearers of divine reconciliation and witnesses to the kingdom of goodness and healing that shall have no end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now continue our worship in the hymn, What a Beautiful Name. After that, Harry and Steph Morrow will bring us our reading in two voices.
didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, he silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you Listen to what God is saying to us today as we find it in Isaiah 58, verses 1 to 10. Pay attention to the type of spirituality God is looking for. On our journey through Lent, God speaks to us and says, Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers your fasting ends up in quarrelling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves. Is this only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord. 
Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To lose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. This is the God's word for us today. Amen. As we come to think about our passage today, let us pray. Loving God of mercy and peace, you have called us to be members of one body. Speak to us about how we are called to live in our time and place and join us with those who in all times and all places have praised your name and served the cause of your kingdom of justice and compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, by the time the Israelite community arrived at Isaiah 58, it had been through its once in living memory disaster. It had been through its equivalent of our coronavirus crisis. It had been through the upheaval and trauma of exile. That was now all in the past. The people had been released from their particular form of lockdown in Babylon. The leadership of the community was building back better, or at least trying to. But society was still in big trouble. The leaders misread what was needed, and their efforts were failing. Perhaps we can learn from them about what not to do. Perhaps we can also learn from Isaiah about what to really focus on as we begin to plan how to put our society together again. And the thing is, the leaders were not bad people. They are trying to do what is right according to their lights. They have not forsaken the commands of God. They are looking for a just way forward according to their understanding of how to live. When their project is not progressing as they imagine it should be, these leaders complain to the highest authority they know, God, asking, why do you not see? Why do you not notice? They're seeking divine approval for their approach. They don't get it. At this point, Isaiah poetically gets to the heart of what's going wrong. Even on fast days, that is, their best days, their most sincere days, the leaders put their own interests ahead of the needs of ordinary people. It turns out that the consciousness of those in the corridors of power only allows them to go so far in doing the right thing. It turns out that in addition to their good intentions, they are also exceedingly entitled and greedy and endlessly clever at arranging things to work out, surprise, surprise, to their benefit. They know how to spin and sloganeer and leverage advantage, even as they come up with slogans like, we're all in it together. Then, in the middle of the poem, there is an abrupt change of voice. Providing the words for Isaiah, God cuts through all the fakery to talk sense and truth 
to those who are willing to hear, God says, is not this the fast, the spiritual discipline, the lifestyle that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and house the homeless poor? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from another human being in need. Real religion consists of doing what must be done to end the chokehold poverty and despair have on the exploited and underpaid, the precarious and the undervalued. And the Bible is down to earth and direct and knowing about this. It knows that full humanness is impossible without food, without shelter, and without clothing. These are indicators of security, signs of dignity, and marks of membership and inclusion and participation in society. If you don't have these elemental provisions. It's like the rest of society saying, you don't belong and we don't care. You don't matter and we're not prepared to do anything about it. Now, it is true that human beings do not live by bread alone, but they do not live at all without bread. And they do not live securely and well without somewhere decent to call home and the essentials to maintain human dignity. Of course, there are conversations and debates and maybe even arguments and bust-ups to be had about how to provide these. But Isaiah and the Bible writers have an incredibly strong grasp of the fundamental bedrock, building blocks of a viable community. From the very heart of God, they know and tell us again and again and again in all the ways they can think of that driving a widening wedge between haves and have-nots will not work. This text today, this poem from the mind and the conviction and the heart of Isaiah is for people like us who care about community and fairness. And that is reflected in our involvement in the developing world and our support for causes there and our involvement in our own community, helping people through an organization like J29. Our text this morning invites us to refocus on what really counts, a way of living and arranging the affairs of society so that food, shelter, and clothing, and whatever their modern equivalents might be, are equitably delivered to all. That refocusing and realignment is part of our work in Lent. It's part of our identity and how we're called to live. Let's pray. God of change and challenge, we pray for our world, which so often puts faith in approaches to life that cannot save or bring contentment, faith in the acquisition of wealth at the expense of social cohesion and solidarity and building up community, faith in the ways of extreme nationalism, sectarianism and racism, which create divisions and lead to oppression and exploitation. Lord, renew our thinking and conform us to the pattern of this world no longer. And we pray for the church, which so often puts faith in approaches to spirituality 
that cannot bring depth and new insight, faith in social respectability, rather than social engagement. Faith in the giving from what we have, but not the giving of what and who we are. Faith in rigid dogma, closed interpretations, and closed minds. Lord, renew our thinking and conform us to the pattern of this world no longer. And we pray for ourselves as we seek and struggle to reappraise our living in this Lenten season and put our faith in you alone. Lord, renew our thinking and conform us to the pattern of this world no longer. Envisioned by Isaiah, empowered by Jesus and following in his footsteps, hear us as we pray together as he taught us saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now, before we draw our time of reflecting together to a close, let me just point out that the urgent need to build true community is utterly biblical, without an ounce of extra interpretation. It is plainly there in the text and it is the truth of the gospel. And you know, anyone who prattles on about the Bible as the word of God, but does not face this mandate, is deceiving themselves. And that is easily done. The leaders in Isaiah 58 did it. And the incredible thing is that so soon after the return from exile, their society, is back to the level of injustice that landed it in exile in the first place. And they can't see what's happening around them. They just seem to want to get back to business as usual as soon as possible. It's like the pre-exilic warning of Amos to the rich has been forgotten. He castigated them for trampling on the needy through a brutally extortionate business ethic while living in luxury themselves. It's like the warning of Micah had never, ever been spoken. He exposed an unscrupulous elite for grabbing all it could from ordinary people, leaving them without the necessities of life. It's like the warning of Jeremiah had been ignored. He hammered home that knowing God means doing justice, defending the cause of the poor, and providing for the needy. The sad truth is that so soon after the high hopes of return, Jerusalem has fallen back so quickly into oppressive patterns of living that so deeply damage life and life chances for so many. As a society, when we emerge from the exile of coronavirus, I hope that we do not make the same mistake. So let's not go back to the same old practices and policies that have undermined community and human well-being over the last 30 or 40 years, creating so much hardship and struggle, distress and heartache for so many. Let's remember that community depends on a social contract in which we belong with and for and to each other and that we are bound together in a common destiny. If society is to flourish, we really do need to be all in it together with everybody included and provided for. 
So let's focus on the truth that we are not just competitive individuals out to get whatever we can, however we can. We belong together. And care of each for all is required for society to function best and to be at peace. Let's really build back better. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, is to deliver a budget this week, Wednesday, I believe. He could do worse than our reading today as the focus of what it should be about. Here's why. Notice how our reading ends. It is after seeing to the interests of everybody that the poet poignantly says, then, at that point, your light will break forth like the dawn, your healing will quickly appear, and your righteousness will be clear for all to see. Then, at that point, you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and God will say, here I am. Then, that is, when you have lived out of true religion, when you have focused on what is truly important, then light will come, healing will begin. This will be the beginning of the end of suspicion and fear, brutality and greed. And it will happen then and not before. It will happen then after authentic caring has been initiated and as a consequence of it. It will happen then, when there is justice and concern, compassion and fairness for all of those left out and left behind. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. In Lent, we address issues in our lives, in our society and in our world in order to allow that then to happen. Amen. We now begin to draw our worship to a close in the hymn, Hope and Glory.
And now, inspired by Isaiah, guided by Jesus, as we journey through Lent to Easter and beyond, may the Spirit help us to break the silence when we should speak up and speak out, to overcome the temptation to wash our hands of the problems of our society and world, to end indifference when we are called to show care birthed from compassion, to defeat the desire to turn our backs on those in need. May the Spirit open our hearts and our minds and our governments to new imaginative, faithful ways to show love for God and for neighbor. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us to stretch us and to sustain us this day and all days. Amen.